So Jan covered um, a good portion of what I'm going to talk about, so I'll just try to talk about those things um, a little bit more in detail. Um, Do you not pay attention to the man behind the curtain? Right. So yeah, uh, Bryce is going to talk basically about, about the integrated assembler in general and what we can do to actually start using it again and what the advantages of, of it are over just going out and using gas. Um, okay, there we go. All right, so first let's talk about what the integrated assembler is. So um, the new assembler, GNU assembler, is um, its own separate project, separate from GCC. It's its own um, uh, binary driver. Um, whereas the Clang's integrated assembler is something that's built into Clang. So when you compile with Clang's integrated assembler, you're not generating some assembly file and then passing it to the new assembler, GNU assembler. It's all being done within the Clang compiler. So this has a couple of really cool benefits. Um, first of all, you've got faster compile times because you're not writing out a file to disk and then reading it in um, with another driver. You've got less forks. You've also, um, You've also got the benefit of having the Clang style diagnostics for assembly, which can be very nice. Um, and the other benefit, which is currently not really a benefit, but presumably, I don't know what happened there. There we go. Um, presumably, it, having the um, assembler built into your compiler gives you some opportunity to do some more optimizations. Um, there's nothing currently in Clang that really take the, at, you don't really get any new, more optimizations right now in Clang when you turn on the integrated assembler. But I could imagine that in the future that some work could be done to um, give you some more optimizations when you're using the integrated assembler. Simply because you've got the, you, your assembler has a ton more information because it's, it's got access to everything that the compiler knows. It's got access to the AST. It's got access to the entire compilation process. Whereas the GNU assembler just gets your assembly file. And it's dumb in that sense. All right, so I'm going to talk about these issues. Um, Jan Simon talked about most of these, as I said. So um, f first of all, I, I want to kind of check with you guys and clarify on this. I tried building yesterday, and I still ran into issues with the ambiguous um, x86 assembly. So I'm not sure that that's Solid. fixed, or if it's fixed, maybe it's not. Maybe we're not using the latest version, and that's why I ran into those. OK, we'll have to look at that tomorrow. Um, yeah, so that, that, that particular discussion point might be a little bit short. Um, also, the integrated assembler has no support for 16-bit um, assembly generation on x86. And it also does not support the GCC um, directives for switching the assembly mode. So that's, that's really kind of two issues there. Um, the, those directives we'll talk about in a little bit. But basically, they allow you to just on the fly say, hey, I want to generate 16-bit you know, code now. I want to generate 32-bit code now. Um, and I heard from Peter last year that he was not really thrilled with how GCC does the 16-bit code gen. Um, That's Peter Anvin. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't remember why he was not thrilled with it, but I, I think that, that there is some um, desire to have a, a clang 16-bit uh, uh, backend for a number of reasons. We'll get into that in a minute. I think Peter really wants to be able to use uh, Code 16, um, have Code 16 support in there so that, that the boot code for 386, um, pardon me, for 32-bit uh, x86, pardon me, can be done with a single tool chain, basically. His, his point was purely that that would be uh, a major feather in the cap of Clang to be able to uh, do it all as opposed to what, what currently has to be done with GCC. 
Um, but the other thing that Peter, Peter had was uh, the issue, of course, was being able to have unified x86 code yeah. without having to specify lengths and so on and so forth. And that's, why, that's what we've been trying to, to basically fix is that side of things. Peter's very, uh, um, very adamant about having a single code base across x86, which makes a lot of sense, obviously. Um, the other thing is the IA does not support the GCC style um, explicit um, register variables. Um, which becomes a problem for, for the, as we saw before, for getting to the stack pointer in a number of other places. We're mostly going to talk about the stack pointer today. Um, and also, there's some issues on ARM with incompatibilities between the GNU assembler and the integrated assembler. All right, so this is the ambiguous inline assembly slide. So um, we've got three exam examples here. So this first one, we've got, you know, add from the A1 register in RAX. So, ooh, trying to not show myself. So Clang and GCC will both accept that one because it's very clear what instruction is meant here. Now, for the next one, Clang and GCC will also accept it because you've got the exp explicit prefix. So it knows that, that you're going to want to do a 32-bit add. For the last instruction here, um, Clang rejects this because it's ambiguous. It, it's not sure error, it's not going to be sure what that, um, what that operand is going to be. So I, assume, I, I don't really want to do this discussion because it sounds like this has been fixed. Uh, well, not necessarily. We basically got around the problem. Right. But, but I, do, I do want, I would like somebody in the audience to try to give me an example of when this would be bad, because I'm not, I, I can't really, in this particular case, I don't think that, that, that there's a case when if it's 32-bit or 64-bit where, where it would be bad. I mean, you, you know what the size of the operand is going to be, right? I mean, and, and at, the, at the very least, I would think the, the compiler's got to know the size of the operand. So in this particular case, there's no question at all. Uh, the third one should be rejected right. because there is no no sane solution to there. The, there are three different, four different sizes you can use, mm -hmm. and they have literally different semantics. The one case we objected to the changes was for the bit test instructions which actually do have exactly the same semantics and depending on the arguments, you either want to use long or quads uh, and uh, one of them is better. And in other okay. cases you can't, it's unambiguous and you have to use one or the other. And it really depends on the arguments and we can't specify at compile time because the arguments are arguments. They're just but but the compiler is it gonna of course know the, uh, the size of the, of the arguments, so it should be able to The, the that compiler out. can know, well, actually, the compiler should not even bother because the compiler can know, but it, the, the level of detail is, so um, if you replace the add with a bit test instruction, mm -hmm. uh, the last example, which is test bit number four at that address, is completely an unambiguous and it doesn't actually matter if you're testing in 32-bit or 64-bit because we're little endy and bit number four is the same regardless, right. right? But bit number four, if you do it in 32-bit mode, you don't need the 64-bit rex prefix. Right. So it's a smaller instruction, it's better. Right. Now if the regis if the it's not a constant four, but it's a register like test this bit in register ECX on that thing, uh, then the size comes from the register size. And if it is e ECX, it has to be 32-bit. If it's uh, RD RCX, it has to be 64 -bit. So it is actually unambiguous in some cases, and in other cases, it, you can choose either, and the semantics are exactly the same, but one of them is better. Right. And doing this at a source code level is stupid because we'd have to pick one or the other. And then we'd have that. 
in 64-bit mode, if we have a 64-bit argument, we'd have to be, pick the 64-bit right. version, which is one byte longer and stupid. So, so any assembler that doesn't do the right thing is broken. But, but I, I mean, I, I think that it should be easy for Kling to do the right thing. Yes, because it, it, it absolutely it, it should. It can figure I, out from the operands. What I, I think what happened was the Clang people had thought about yeah. the add case where the semantics aren't actually the same. This, is, this then, is actually the example from their website. So okay, I'm sure yeah. that, they, that they thought about the add case. And, and in that case, they're absolutely right. And then they didn't realize that the bit operations actually have completely different semantics and, uh, and uh, act differently. So they, they just had this rule that you have to give a size uh, that is true in general, but not true in some cases. And, and then we pushed back on that and said, hey, you're wrong in this case. And I think they're, from the discussion I saw, uh, uh, I, I, I think they, all the Clang ass, uh, IA people agreed in the end. So, so I think then the, the thing that we got to do here is determine whether or not this is actually fixed. And if it's not fixed, um, it needs to be fixed. Absolutely. What about a big Indian architecture? Yeah, on, on big Indian, you would have to give the size. Well, even big Indian. Some, uh, some big endian have odd bit numbering. Like the bit numbering can be big endian or little endian, even if you're so uh, on PowerPC, for example, which is big endian, I think bit number zero is defined to be the high bit in the documentation. No, we don't actually use it that way, so I don't think it matters. But. Add if we don't have the size, that's a bug. You know, on big Indian, you'd have to uh, do the size. I mean, my argument was always that this is kind of like a short jump versus a long jump. When we write inline assembly, we just say, hey, jump to that label. And then we expect the assembler to pick the right instruction encoding for the size of jump. And the bit test instruction is kind of the same thing, where we expect the assembler to pick the right instruction encoding for the size and pick the smart one. Uh, and, and it was, we could add the size, but it would be bad for everybody. And nobody really cares in the end. It's one byte. It's not going to matter, but it's, uh, it's the principle of this thing that when, when the CLANG people say, hey, you're doing something wrong, we're just pushing back and saying, no, you're just being stupid. So <laughs> it's... You know, one of the problems here is that there's no standard um, specified uh, assembly language for x86. It's, it's just kind of the, G, what, GCC, and, you know. All the assemblies. Peter Anwin does his own, what's his assembler called? NASM. And NASM does some other things yeah. where it just takes advantage of knowing, okay, I'll be smart about this. So, and the Microsoft assembler, I'm sure, does other things. So, so yeah, the question is, what should you do? Just how much should you expect the people to specify by hand? And how much should the assembler say, hey, I know what the answer is? Yeah. All right, I'm going to move on to the next issue unless there's any other questions or comments um, on this. All right, so um, next one to talk about is the 16-bit mode in the mode switching. So this is important pretty much for the boot code and for bootloaders. Um, I, I do kind of believe that while this is an important thing, Given the amount of work that, that this would involve, this might not be the highest priority um, thing in the world. Um, writing the 16-bit backend is probably, I, I think, and from talking to Peter last year, I think it's probably a project that would take you know, a programmer four, maybe five months to do and to do properly. Um, 
I, I do think it could be potentially an interesting Google Summer of Code. Um, the question would be whether it, it's feasible to do it um, over a summer, and um, also, you know, whether we could get somebody like like Peter or somebody else who who would really know the stuff to be a mentor. Um, but that's, that's actually a bit of a challenge. Uh, I think I think uh, in fact, if somebody could. Uh, be a good mentor or something like that. Perhaps that's, this is a real opportunity for, for GSOC or one of the other uh, uh, things like that. Because really, this is just a matter of time and a certain amount of effort for somebody to do, to sit down with the right person guiding them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think I was joking to Behan the other day that there's like three people in the world who I think probably know how to do this. Right. Um, probably all of them are at this conference. <laughs> um, so so the, the code switching directives I think are a little bit easier. Um, certainly I think doing the code 32 and the code 64 is probably not that hard. Um, I, I'd have to look into the claim code, but I mean both of those backends are there. Presumably, we, we could um, modify the code so that it would switch the mode um, when it sees one of these directives. Um, yeah. But I don't, know, I don't know if the dot .code32 and the dot .code64 directives have a lot of use if we don't have the dot .code16. Um, so. All right, so explicit registry variables. So this is um, another kind of um, lot of potential work project. Um, the, so what this syntax does is basically it places a variable into a specific hardware register. So it, you know, in this case here, we're placing, th this is a um, kind of odd case because you're not actually, this is not a general purpose register. Um, this is just kind of assigning an alias for the stack pointer. But imagine that that's you know, some general purpose register. So if that was some general purpose register, then we would be saying, hey, we want this variable to always be in that register. So that case is kind of tricky because if you say that, then the compiler has to know that it cannot use that register for register allocation. So that means, so technically in terms of the, So that's not strictly true, as in it can use it for register allocation. It just has to know that when that particular entity is live, it's in that register. Right. So, um, but but while while that while that is in scope, it can't use that register for. So if you if you've got a global, um, I mean if you have a global uh, explicitly named register variable for some general purpose register, you're telling the compiler you can't ever use this for regi register allocation. No, you can. The, my point is you can use it, but if there's a live range that corresponds to that particular global variable, when that live range is active, that's when you can, that's right. when you cannot use it. Right. But right. when it's not, while, while it's in scope. But I mean, I'm assuming that a global variable is always going to be in, in scope. I'm sorry, can you repeat One that? Second. <laughs> I added that, that in the x86 code, they, they were using this for getting the stack pointer, but I removed it in my GCC LTO patch kit because it doesn't work with GCC LTO either. So when, when GCC is in LTO mode, it, it doesn't support global register variables. So I think it has to be killed for GCC too. Oh, so it needs to be fixed in both cases. Yeah, both yeah I already have a patch. Well, I, it does, I, I think it works in GCC. Okay, right. Right. Um, so, so, I mean, th this is a hairy thing because y you, you basically have to hook this information into the register allocation. And in terms of claying, this means that, first of all, you've got to do something in the AST end. So first of all, you've got to have some AST node that represents this data. And then you've got to add some pass that goes over the whole AST and that says, hey, find all of these places and inform register allocation about that. Um, and then you know you've got to consider scoping too. So maybe you have to, you know, when you're doing register allocation for a particular um, subtree, you've got to then search that subtree and figure out, hey, you know, under this scope, I can't use this particular 
register? So, I mean, the stack pointer, I think building stack pointer is the right thing to yeah. do. Uh, that's not a problem. Some architectures, and um, it's possible that LLVM does not care. Uh, if I recall correctly, some architectures use the global register thing for um, the per CPU pointer. I think alpha does that, and uh, and if it's only alpha, you probably don't <laughs> care, right? I, I was about to say. But, <laughs> but it, there might be other issues like PowerPC that are actually still relevant because... Uh, More importantly, Zen uses this. Okay. Yeah. And, and also, the, the other thing is not only does Zen use this, but the C library uses this, and most dynamic linkers use this. And not for the stack pointer, but for, um, for Zen it's used for, for um, various virtualization stuff. Um, but the Zen case and the, the glibc case are not as prominent in the kernel as the, hey, we want to get to the stack pointer case. So I think that fixing this generally for um, explicit global um, register variables is a longer term project. But I think that built in stack pointer is very viable. And this is actually, I have to give all the credit to Mark here. Um, the solution that I wanted to do for this was not as elegant as this. So there's already this function that GCC has called built-in frame address. Um, so if, if you look at both, compil both compilers support this, the code for built-in frame address and the code for built-in stack pointer would look basically the same. So to actually add this to Clang, you'd basically, basically have to go in and add a new value to the intrinsics enum. You'd, you'd have to add a new case in the front end where it's generating the AST, and you'd have to add a new case in um, the code generation, which um, just handles that particular new AST node. So it's basically three places in the Clang compiler that you'd have to modify, front, front end, code gen. And is uh, this something that could be added to GCC as well? Yeah, I think that it's just as easy to add to GCC. But, but I don't think you really need it, because in GCC it works fine to just have an, an empty inline assembler with one stack pointer output. Sorry, can you... In GCC, you can't just use empty inline assembler for stack pointer output. That works totally fine. <laughs> so there, there's no need for any new built-ins. I, I think that it would be nice to have it in both compilers, though, because then you, can, you have a unified way to get to it. Um, and also, I mean, I, I think there's other use cases outside of the kernel where this could be useful. But so my, I think this is the way to go um, to solve this problem. Some architecture, and we have one that uses a register for a base address of for addressing. You could use the same technique there, right? Yeah. So it's it's it, it's a technique that could be used for any register that has a defined purpose at all per parts during the AD. Right. Right. Poss possibly, you, maybe we don't even want a built-in stack pointer. Maybe we want a built-in, you know, something that that's more general purpose. Um, that might be a little bit hairier to do, but I think that you have a good point. Any register that has a, that's not a general purpose register, you should be able to easily get access to it with your compiler. Cer certainly, it would be very cool for getting access to um, debug registers. Um, there's, a, there's a, lot of, a lot of use cases outside of the kernel that I can think of um, that this would be useful for. Oh, I'm running out of time. Uh, just, we should probably get on to the next okay. section. Um, Oh, well, that's the last slide. So, oh, well, that okay, so this is the part where I'm going to kind of point at Behan because I'm not really that familiar with these um, ARM assembly problems, but I'm going to give you my general understanding of it, um, most of which is based on hearsay that I've heard from Behan. Um, so, if this, any of this is not correct, it's just because I haven't heard it correctly from him. So, um, basically, there's this unified assembly language that, that's the sp standard for ARM. And Clang implements it with their integrated assembler. And as far as I understand, GCC influenced something kind of like it, but there's a bunch of extensions, and Clang doesn't support those extensions. Basically, there's a pre-unified assembly language format that is used in some of the code, and in other cases, it is unified assembly, uh, but with GCC extensions. Now, I've talked to the people who are a part of that uh, at um, LLVM and the people who are working on that sort of thing. And for instance, the people at um, Renato, for instance, at Linaro <clears throat> has looked at this a bit. Linaro actually uh, is fortunate enough to 
employ both people on the GCC team and on the LLVM team. And uh, internally in, in Lenaro, they've basically talked about whether or not it makes sense to implement the same extensions in Clang in order to be able to support these things. And both the GCC and LLVM guys have come to the agreement that it would be insane to try and track what's going on on, on the, um, the gas side just because it's moving too fast. Basically, it's chasing taillights the whole way. Uh, the, the, um, the general agreement from both camps was basically it would be better if everybody started to use unified assembly um, because both assemblers support it and ultimately that means that they're following a defined standard as opposed to something that in many cases isn't even written down. Um, that's one of the problems with gas is it's not fully documented. Yeah, that's, that's a okay. pretty frequent problem with that. Not my direct, uh, this is talking to a lot of other people, so I may have it wrong. If anybody in the room has, has better information, by all means. Uh, any, any questions, comments, concerns, complaints? All right, um, so before I, I get off here, I'm obligated by my employer to briefly state, I'm from Louisiana State University Center for Computation and Technology. It's a great research center. I'm from the Stellar Group. Um, yeah. And he's just up the road. So. Yeah, like literally, like it's just a couple miles inland. Anyways, thank everybody for your time. That's great. Well, thank you very much, Bryce.